making your dig at this one or alluvium. Oh, granted. We route this one. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Very well, nice to see you. Yeah. So, Emory Peter is going to be joining the commission, taking Karen's spot, but has not been sworn in yet. So he's sitting in the audience for tonight. <laughs> this meeting or the next one? Uh, he'll be here for the next one, I presume. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although whether will be here or down the street remains to be seen. <laughs> We're moved. City Hall is closing for two years to be remodeled. Yeah. Yep. So we'll be using <laughs> space. Vintage, our vintage interior design is going to be. I mean, <laughs> we did it through that HVAC yeah. expansion. We did. We did. Is that before me? Or? I don't remember <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yes, I remember, but I remember well, we were proving it. All right, I think we will get underway. This is the November 9th meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission of Bangor. My name is Liam Reardon, chair of the commission. And with us this evening are Anne-Marie Quinn on my far left, Nathaniel King, Edmund Cherneski, and Matthew Whitecamp, all members of the commission. And we are joined by Ann Krieg from the city planning office and also our consultant, Mike Pollan. Uh, we have no applications on our agenda for tonight, so I am going to spare you all hearing my usual preamble about the codes and the rules and the votes and that whatnot. And we're going to turn to the new business on the agenda. And the major item we have is a presentation from Mike about new construct guidelines for new construction in historic districts. So we got a rehearsal of this last meeting for some of us. So we're expecting an even better performance, well, Mike. Hope I can fix it. What we reviewed last time, we're going to see what we're talking about tonight, but then afterwards, I think what Ann would like to do is open it up to a discussion more thoroughly about what the commission is up against when they review for new buildings and structures in uh, historic districts. So you really haven't done much of that as a commission. You did, if you recall, we had one application most recently, which was to replace a house that had burned at the corner of Pond Street and Mr. Green Street. Remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was reviewed or that started to review yeah, under yeah. that part of the ordinance that you would refer to for new construction in historic districts. And that's what we're talking about. So the comment I made here was the communities evolve. Bangor continues to evolve. And the need for a community to evolve is going to the needs of its community, its citizens. Uh, and as time goes on, Bangor will continue to see more and more changes. And those things that will be coming to the commission involve some of the things we're going to talk about, <clears throat> which include accessory dwelling units, which ADUs, which is a big topic, state driven legislation, and now law directs communities to make provisions to accommodate ADUs as a method, uh, one method in helping to provide affordable housing. Wanted to say that when, as, as the change occurs, this is a wonderful image of Bangor, 1836. We're far different than that today. Oh, my, your mic on. Oh, my, I'm sorry. Were you recording? Thank you, Cody. Sorry. Um, so uh, for 1836 to today, the graphic that we see on the left is one that you're familiar with. That's a wonderful bird's eye view aerial of, of Bangor that you can anyone can download. You go to the Library of Congress's website and type in uh, panoramic views, Bangor, Maine, and you'll be able to download that beautiful image. So you can see Bangor uh, continues to evolve. And those are things that the HPC will be uh, tasked with, that kind of change. So Historic Preservation Chapter 148, the purpose of that uh, we're going to talk about in just a moment. That's basically the chapter uh, that directs you to review for us and issue a certificate of appropriateness for any project, whether it's an addition, a modification, alterations. In this case, though, we're talking more specifically about new structures within the historic districts. 
The uh, Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, you referred to those. Um, those 10 standards for rehabilitation are the same, pretty much the same 10 standards that we review by here as a commission. Um, but they have additional guidelines and other things that sometimes you may want to refer to. And one of them that's most popular that you've probably all seen is a document that looks like this. You can download that or Anne can make that available to y'all. That talks about how a commission, how any commission will move forward with making the tough decisions that you have to make with an application. So uh, another evaluation standards, 148-9 uh, is what we're talking about tonight, which is really new construction in historic districts. Um, so I'm just going to read this um, in 148-1. This is the statutory authority that gives the commission authority and what the purpose is for this part of the ordinance is to assure that new buildings or structures constructed in neighborhoods and districts of historic or architectural value are designed and built in a manner which is compatible with the character of the neighborhood or district. That's a, a key word, compatible. So we'll come back to that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the approvals are required. Um, you issue a certificate of appropriateness, hopefully after the review um, of your uh, application, of this application. And new construction or principal or accessory building, remember that term accessory building, or structure visible from a public street where such building or structure will be located in the historic district. Brings up an interesting point. I guess I've never really paid attention <laughs> that closely to that language, but it basically says when it's visible from a public street, which is unique. So that's to say that if it was tucked back on a property where you couldn't see it from a public street, that you may not have as much supervision over what could happen in that location. And you'll see in the standards that we review, the 10 standards that you're going to be using to review new uh, construction, that one of them has to do with its proximity on the street, and location on the street. A lot of it has to do with how it fits into that neighborhood setting. So can, uh, a certificate of appropriateness, additional application requirements. This is key because the application that we got uh, was adequate, but it was not complete. So there were a few things in that application that would have helped the commission's review of that had that been provided. And that's why you must, we must require this information to be with any application that comes in for new construction. And that would be architectural plans drawn to scale. So you know clearly what you're talking about in size and bulk, because you're going to be basing your decisions on that information. You need a site plan showing the building and its relationship to the property lines and adjacent buildings. That's other critical information that was not provided in that last application, if you recall. And if the project is an alteration of an existing exterior exterior features, then the applicant must submit a site plan, which includes the buildings and exterior features as they now exist, adjacent buildings and proposed alterations. I guess my best advice to the commission is this. When you review all of those 10 standards that we're going to be talking about in a moment, you need to have the applicant clearly articulate how they're meeting those standards, each one of those. If you don't hear it, from the applicant, you need to ask it because your decisions are going to be based on how well they met those 10 standards. Okay. So they may, uh, and we'll go, we'll go over those in just a moment. Um, by the way, you can ask questions anywhere along the line. I don't want this to be like a lecture. Peter, so, one thing I'll point out. We have the two codes that we make decisions about. The certificate of appropriateness <laughs> has a higher standard in terms of the commission code that requires four votes to be approved. I see. Yeah, the other code only requires three. So some of the minutiae. Okay. Really gotcha. <laughs> In Bangor, we have uh, kind of two overlying districts. Um, one of them is the Bangor area revitalization zone or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. those are mostly downtown and waterfront areas. Um, so sometimes the commission's reviewing from both those codes in a particular application. Design review will be a box that has to be checked off and a certificate of appropriateness is in the historic district. So, <clears throat> um, 
Also, evaluation standards say construction of a new building or structure within a historic district shall be generally of such design, form, proportion, mass, configuration, building material, texture, and location on lots as will be compatible with other buildings in the historic district and with adjacent streets and open spaces in keeping with the area. So that's in, a, in that paragraph. It pretty much sums up what those critical categories are going to be that you need to get information on from each application in in a historic district new structures and finally all new construction and all new additions in historic to any historic landmark or any building or structure in a historic district shall be compatible again that word with the surrounding historic district and building or structure which it is all which is it is altering in terms of the following factors and these are the 10 standards that you will be reviewing by so the first thing you're going to want to make sure is is it compatible with the building heights of other buildings in the district especially those adjacent to it so what this um, and by the way, I bought a lot of these graphics from the city of Albany, New York. Uh, so we give them credit at the end. Um, and Albany came up at the last meeting, and I'm not sure why, but it was uh, it was mm -hmm. just interesting. So what they're saying here is that the building heights should be in that top graphic, should be within the range of heights of area buildings. Step larger buildings down to smaller buildings, which they've done here. As they got closer to the street, the scale of it reduced down. Avoid construction on the bottom graphic that greatly varies in height from buildings in the same block. So, if, and I think there was some of that information was provided in that last application, and I don't mean to pick on that one at all, but it was maybe slightly inadequate because it didn't show you the heights of the other buildings adjacent to it. So you would you would have been struggling to figure out how that fit. Number two, yeah. We are reviewing other kinds of proposals, not for new construction. We are explicitly not to consider the broader context. Things like I, I remember a meeting where we talked about, you know, walking to look at it or people's knowledge of that block and people saying, well, we can only really assess what is in the application itself. So. I have a similar recollection. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, we can't, certainly can't meet. You can, you, there's requirements that you can't have a without a public notice. You can't go out and visit. The, you could maybe individually in, I think, or ride by. Or, yeah, I mean, board members shouldn't do their own research. As um, the chair said, you make your decision based on the information given to you. Given. That's why we have them do photographs of, you know, the area and mm -hmm. things like that so that you'll have that information. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, as residents in Bangor, you're going to have a familiar, um, you know, you're going to have some familiarity of neighborhoods, but um, your decision should be based on what you're provided. Yeah. Can I ask a question? It would be if we don't think that the information provided is adequate, we can ask for. You can ask for clarification or, yeah. Great. Yep. Yeah. You know, part of the standard process is that an application will come in to the city. Mm -hmm. They vet it. Oh, I see. They send it to Mike. Mike reviews it okay. and writes up a report about it. And then we get in a okay. PDF package the week before the meeting their application plus Mike's comments about gotcha. the inspection. So approach. <laughs> okay. And I'm usually just directing the commission to consider certain things that are important them in their deliberation. So um, this all appears also to be directed to residential neighborhoods. It's not the case. It really applies to all of our historic districts and several are large commercial districts in the downtown. So this uh, scale and proportion, this is kind of a, an interesting category. But um, what they're showing you is that there's new buildings should relate in scale and proportion to adjacent historic buildings. That's different than the size necessarily, building height. Um, avoid buildings that are too large or too small or in scale or massing to adjacent buildings. Um, the points over here, proportion of the building width and height to the front elevation. So what that means is that you've got a certain uh, proportion that needs to be considered relative to if you want to be compatible with other buildings in the in the district 
the applicant must prove that they've got considered scale and proportion of their building does approach those standards, satisfying those standards. Um, that last application actually had an interesting concept to it. It did have a gable to the street. I will say this is this this was some of the success of that application, if you will. It had it was oriented in the right direction, uh, gable to the street like the house that was there previously, and other houses up and down the street. It had that, and it had a porch on it, and the porch actually related to porches that you saw up and down that street in Union Street. So. He didn't articulate that necessarily, or the applicant didn't, but those were things that were in that application that gave it a little bit more of a positive read. You know. <clears throat> so next you will be asking about rhythm and relationship uh, to solids and voids in the front facade. Solids and voids merely speaks about the arrangement of windows and doors, that's the voids. And the solids is the solid panel of the outside facade. So in this case, the window and door opening should be located to create a pattern that's similar to those found in the historic homes. Um, down bottom, avoid odd windows and door shapes that lack uh, rhythm in their placement. Uh, and you can see they've done some kind of a gommy thing there. <laughs> um, but uh, that's really important. The relationship of the solids um, and voids has to do with the pattern that we see. And when you look at a building, even if you squint your eyes from 100 yards away, you clearly see the pattern of the window arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I think in that last application, not to pick on that, but I think they had some sides of that building were well articulated. And another side, the commission had some serious questions about because windows seem to be real, all over the place. You recall that? Yeah. Oh, oh, what happened there? Did I change something? Whoops. I didn't mean oh, to. We lost that. our shared screen. Um, Cody. Right there, he's getting it back there. I can see what he's doing. Okay. okay. Just like that. Um, so yeah, so that's that that's what you'd be considering in that case. This rhythm and relationship of the building to the open space. Uh, between it and adjoining buildings. This is also a rather critical aspect. Um, buildings, when you look around and drive up and down neighborhoods, uh, especially in the historic districts, you'll see a fairly common arrangement of the buildings in the space that's between them. The open space is referred to as that unbuilt portion between. So you get a rhythm when you go up and down the street. That's pretty clear. I don't think you have much question about that. The rhythm uh, and relationship of entrances and porch projections to the sidewalks and the streets. The graphic on the bottom is a clip from a Sanborn map um, that you may all be familiar with. It happens to be Maple Street and Parkview. And if you look closely, you can see the arrangement of the fronts of the buildings are almost entirely consistent up and down the street. Um, and that's a sense that you get when you ride up and down those streets, a very consistent look. So what they're saying is be careful with that alignment. <clears throat> Try this, not that. When you push something back, it looks like a hole in the fabric of that street line. So that last application, I'm not sure how well that would have satisfied these requirements because it was much, much smaller than the house that was there previously. So it was hard to get probably the same consistent amount of open space between it and what other houses in the district had. It also is odd because it's a corner lot. It's so a corner lot. Different that, depending absolutely. On the yep, different absolutely. Different That's different true. Yeah. That's true to meet that. Right. It also didn't begin to be tall like the buildings around it. It, it didn't. Before. So so there you go. That that would be something on building height that you would you would bring up. So this happens to be a wonderful house up on Union Street, um, which I just love. Talk about textures. So the materials and textures of the facade of the building. Um, they're just asking for you, to, the commission, to consider what materials are used in the neighborhood, whether they're clapboards or could they, they could be shingles or they could be any other sort of exterior material. Um, nobody's expecting anybody to match that sort of architecture today. But it's a really wonderful example of what you can do with shingles. <laughs> so fabulous house. 
I just always wondered if you see the beautiful turret, the big heavy turret, talk about massing. This is really a massing study. This has got medieval castle uh, architecture. When you go up the steps to the <laughs> to the front door, you go underneath that big heavy turret. It must feel like maybe they're gonna dump some hot oil on you or something, you don't know, but I can just imagine on Halloween with that house lit up, it would be really quite an experience to enter in underneath that heavy turret. And that's what the architect did. I think it was Patterson, Frank Patterson designed this. And um, he really did that purposely to feel that weight, you know, as you go underneath it. I think that's called a painted lady. This one? Oh, that's called a painted generally, lady. Generally, I know in California, that's San Francisco, that's a painted. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that these were original colors to the house either. Who knows? Yeah. We give an allowance for social materials for the temperature to stand dry. Like if they're not yep. on it, it's having to be sort of slate or something. And we can't, you know, replicate that. We give an allowance for an adequate substitute material that yeah. matches that. Okay. Yeah, I think you would. Okay. I think into, the commission has to be aware that with today's materials and labor costs, um, that sort of construction is not going to likely happen again. <clears throat> That's why it's important to protect them so so much. But there are synthetic products out there that when they're properly applied can be a perfect substitute, you know. But that's, again, up to the applicant to prove to the commission. I think that last application had vertical board and batten on the outside. Yeah. So the commission might ask, well, can you show us other examples of houses in that district that used board and batten? You know, board and batten is a common Gothic revival material. It was... Um, Peter's house. Um, so it's, it, I, but today they you could synthesize that with products that maybe would last longer than would that we have today. So, and roof shapes, you're going to be asked as a commission um, about compatibility of roof shapes. So here's just a kind of sampling of some roof shapes that you're going to, you're possibly going to see. Bangor has a little bit of all of those. The mansard roofs are the ones that are usually in the taller. We don't have very many, just two story. They're the really more vertical, you know, second empire sort of design houses. And a jerkin head, this one down in the lower right, is actually not unfamiliar to New England. Um, you'll see them occasionally. Um, it's just, it's a German detail, if I remember. So gables are very popular and you can see the gable and the orientation of that front facade to the street is really critical that's most critical. So you could have a gable house, but if it's turned the wrong way, it's not gonna satisfy what was going on in the rest of the street, right? So it's, it's roof shape and the orientation. And the directional expression of the front facade, such as vertical or horizontal. So uh, the second empire building on the top is very, very expressed a very vertical detail. All the windows are narrow and tall. They're divided in half. They're, it's really stressing this vertical alignment, whereas the prairie style sort of house bungalow on the bottom is stressing its tie to the landscape and is a very horizontal look. So if somebody comes into a district that has second empire houses up and down the street and wants to drop a bungalow in there, the commission might say, you know, you're kind of missing that expression that's similar to what's going on in the rest of the neighborhood, right? vertical and not to mention the building height and, and scale and i think this is the last one you review for mechanical equipment such as heat pumps we've seen heat pumps a lot um, solar panels they're coming more and more communication devices hvac units and similar should be located in such a way to minimize the visual impact um, so what they're showing you here is this putting them maybe towards the back of the property if that's at all possible or to the side, certainly not in the front yard where it's going to be most visible, um, and not this where you would have, say, a satellite dish on the house or, or even solar panels located on the front. I think the commission's seen quite a few. Uh, we saw some applications from West Broadway that actually tucked air, air uh, heat pumps towards the back of the house. So I think the commission determined that that was really not very visible at all at all from a right away and so, they screened them okay. and they screened them they landscaped them so um <clears throat> but we're going to see more and more of that sort of infringement on buildings downtown you remember we reviewed the commission reviewed solar panels for a flat roof coming over the bridge mm -hmm. now you have to look for that 
I didn't even notice they'd put it in, but it's been in place and it was it was so innocuous that you, and it was the parapet around the building pretty much disguises it. So the commission made, I think, a good decision about that. Fit in, not a large array, but it really pretty much covers that one roof. That project turned out pretty good. Pretty good. I could see a dilemma with this if a building has, a, say, a long street orientation, and that's also the southern exposure, which yeah. is where mm -hmm. it's true. That's true. So that's going to be a think about this balance. That's the challenge. The yeah, you're absolutely right. And a, a lot of them now, Liam, are doing freestanding ones that set up in the yard, like on a stanchion. So how will that, I mean, that's an effect on the landscape of the property. So how would that be considered? The roof tiles, right. Who can afford those? I don't know. <laughs> and nobody from around here. So we're going to talk just a little bit about. Um, I'm going to switch switch the switch it up to talk a little about accessory dwelling units. For those of you that read the papers, follow the news, you probably know that the state has um, enacted law legislation now in law, um, which kind of directs communities and correct me if I'm wrong, to make provisions for ADUs um, within their communities. And the city, I think, had a chance to verse their own ordinance language for that mm -hmm. right. um, and has done that. Um, so there's very specific things that work for Bangor that may not work for any other community done specifically for that. But ADUs are what we probably will be seeing uh, coming into historic districts, trying to modify portions of the property to allow what they used to call a mother-in-law's apartment, but it's not that anymore. It's much more than that. Um, <clears throat> What's happened is, and if you trace this line back even earlier, when Bangor was built in the 1860s and 1870s, the average household size was about 5.7 people. We're down to 2.7 people, 2.6 right now. So the sizes of households have shrunk. These large historic houses that were built for the purpose of four or five bedrooms may not be... Um, used as fully as they could be. So this is not done to promote Airbnbs as far as I know, but it could have the result of doing some of that just by the provisions of it. The hope is that uh, what we're hearing now is that not only the interest rates being high, but real estate's not moving for several reasons. And one is because elders like myself can't afford to sell their property and buy anything in today's market that's going to suit them. So that's going on big time. And as a result, millenniums are not given an opportunity to even enter the market in any particular way. So they're having to be creative and doing their own things. But ADUs are here to stay. They come in many different shapes, as we're going to talk about. And, the dis and I think the commission will be seeing a fair amount of this. So I'll go on to say accessory dwelling units must also meet evaluation standards that we talked about tonight. If they're going in a historic district, every bit of that, your application of the ordinance would apply. Um, and in Bangor, I think specific to Bangor, the ADU area may not be greater than 50% of the principal dwelling or 1,000 square feet, whichever is less. 1,000 square feet is not very big. Or an accessory dwelling, it's, it's what not what you'd call a teeny home, which is six or seven hundred square feet. It's larger than that, but um, and the maximum height I think in Bangor states is twenty five feet. So Bangor allows them um, ADUs are allowed in certain zones within the city, uh, URD urban residential districts one and two, and is that multifamily and service district and. MNSD, yep. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly the pale yellow into a light orange. Um, so you can see it. I'm not sure how our districts overlay with the zoning map, but you can see a lot of the city is zoned either URD one or two. It's probably the most the, the most common zone that we see in the city until you get downtown. Um, 
ADUs may not be located in the front of the lot. That's a that's specific to Bangor, I believe, which says that you can't come into encroaching on that front yard any further than the principal building. Um, some ordinances actually say you have to be halfway back the depth of the principal building. Because in Bangor, we have a lot of deep lots and the houses usually go back, you know, big house, little house, back house, barn, you know, that arrangement, that linear arrangement. So uh, you certainly have to be careful about infringing on the front yard in a very narrow lot. Um, ADUs contained in the principal dwelling unit below the finished grade must have a daylight entry. Um, and that's a basement dwelling. Um, the main UBEC board uh, code also has requirements for emergency escape windows out above. That's not for your purview, but you should know that they have to have legitimate escape windows out of bedrooms as well. So, so it's considered an accessory dwelling, you know, even though it's actually inside the barn. Can be, can be, yep. Yeah, good <laughs> lead into this graphic right here, Peter. So they do come in many forms. You see the detached ADU. You can have an attached ADU. You can have one that's above the garage. This was most common when people were trying to make provisions for the mother-in-law. The basement, interior basement ADU. <clears throat> interior converted garage. Taking the garage and converting it. And an interior upper floor, maybe like the attic space or something. So all of these could occur within the historic districts in whatever form. We won't know until we start to see them. And Liam caught a really interesting thing last time that others might wanna see here. Uh, this just basically says that they can come in various forms. Um, and so the ADU is actually, I think in the portion above the garage in this case. And Liam was quick to say, well, gee, their roof form didn't necessarily uh, match in too well with the, exi the existing house, which is a hip roof. So, uh, and that's a good point. So I'm not sure how the commission would have handled that. Probably would have thrown them out of here, <laughs> right? <laughs> and this yeah. is interesting. This is a cute little um, ADU, which is going to be the more common form that I think the commission might be seeing on properties. This is actually built by a company here in Maine called Backyard ADUs in Brunswick. So they have several different models that you can pick from. Um, these are not cheap. These are 400 bucks a square foot. That's what I'm saying. I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because they're teeny. And that includes foundation and some provisions for earthwork. But when you're going to put a house like any, of any sort on, another, like on a property that already exists, that is not served by, say, public sewer or public utilities, You've got some big expenses. You have septic systems. Now, most of our districts are more densely in the core of the city. So whether or not you see standalones, I don't know. <clears throat> and I just want to say thank you to these folks where I bought, stole some stuff from. <laughs> and um, the city of Bangor's GIS mapping system, if you've not been there before, you can go on the city's website. You can click on a GIS and go to mapping. And if you've never been there, there's wonderful mapping resource for tax maps, for zoning, for historic districts, for everything else you look and ever need. So I think, Anne, you wanted to continue to have more of a conversation about the commission's review. Yeah, we can uh, stop sharing, uh, Cody, on okay. the, yeah. Right. So in thinking about, um, you know, issues with compatibility, and scale, um, you know, it's that that particular lot. It's a corner lot. Is a struggle, and you know, we want to put that property back out for an RFP. Um, and you know, it, it's it's a tough one because they're going to have to come to see you. But so, you know, it's it's hard to look at an application that you haven't seen yet. But if there are certain elements that you think are um you know are, are most important that you want to be sure that anybody who thinks about putting a house there that they're going to respect that kind of direction would be great because we could put that in the rfp to say you know attention to detail on these elements are going to you know are that your project will be reviewed for 
that's just the way I would do it. You know, our community is this place that that you live. Yep. They would have to go there and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the safest way. I remember the applicant talking about in their design, they had attempted to draw some harmony between the Union Street side of across the street which was not in the historic district and what he was doing with the historic district and i think that may have led him astray on his design or on their design because they were trying to reconcile things that weren't part of our design review part of the standards and not fitting with the rest of the district mm. do you think that that would be enough to direct them in the direction to say um, I think that's going to be the safest method. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're going to continue to require that they get a certificate of appropriateness from you before the city closes on the property. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Human habitation. <laughs> That's right. Well, that would not be moved to construction. That would be construction. Does that limitation apply to any part of the use of this? The, well, the ADU requirement, it's, yeah, it's 50% or a thousand, up to 1,000 square feet of livable space. So, so the garage, it's like, if you did it as a garage apartment, like with the barn, um, you know, you still had cars that that square footage would not be counted. But the existing parish house that had given the space that would be more than a thousand feet would not qualify as a ADU. No, if it didn't have the if if it's in a zone that doesn't allow a second dwelling unit and only allows an accessory dwelling unit, yeah. Yeah. Good question. And looking at the different types of ADUs, it, it suggested that ADUs can be incorporated into a, a, you know existing structure. Right. But I would presume that that you know, for example, the second floor or whatever over the garage. I mean, from a square footage perspective, it's only part of that building. Right. Um, so if you're talking about a carriage house and you know renovating part of it to be a ADU, would it then uh, the thousand square feet would be just the area being renovated as an ADU versus... Right, just you know, being occupied as a separate dwelling unit. Yeah. And a quick question as regards to this, the Historic Preservation Commission, there was regards to ADUs then. Is this, is the purview of this commission then based on the exterior view and what it, what it looks like and interior, not at all? Not just exterior only. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So in that last application, I mean, I'm on the building is But the location of those two those two buildings being on the property is somewhat similar to the floor mm -hmm. But if you go back um, further in time, <clears throat> that, that was it was very different than what we can see now. In, in that there was a there was a barn that was attached to the house. It wasn't originally a separate building. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to turn it off. But, um, <clears throat> so, so yeah. So that there was the house. Mm -hmm. And then originally, the, there was a big barn at the end of it, attached. And then there was, I, I don't know whether it burned or what, and then they built a garage like 60 years later. And the city was uh, certain, so, somebody in the city was telling them that that really was the original garage, which it definitely was not. So I think we have to go back far enough just to see in the beginning what it was yeah. not that we have to replicate that but we have to know just information although i you know i think if it is new construction that we're evaluating it on it, it might be more important to think about how it would compare to the existing buildings that are there mm -hmm. you know, like how would you know if let's say you know you might have a site that had three different houses on it over time well, how do you, and, and now there's none there. So how do you pick mm. what's the yeah. historic state that you want to replicate? Well, and, and, you have to pay attention to the houses in the, in the yeah. right. surrounding area. I mean, I, that, so I think, you know, to me with new construction, that would be the bigger priority yeah. thinking about how does it, how is it compatible with the existing right. Oh yeah, neighborhood. sure. I'm just saying, because, um, there was confusion. Yeah, that that's the neighborhood that I lived in for about sixty years, so I know it very well. And um, there was a problem in the city. This is quite a long time ago. Was requiring a person interested in the property to restore a garage that was never historic. That, that that's I'm sorry. I does that sound too uh, confusing to talk about? No, no. Like oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's great. It's great to talk about these kinds of things because it is complicated. It's hard to figure out mm. this balance. And right. I do think Amory makes a really good point. I think we do have to consider the history and the life of the structure because it is a living entity in some regards, and that has changed over time. That we have to understand how the building was originally and how that use has changed over time. I think that is an important consideration to make while we're looking at this, even for a new construction. But I mean, are we going to go look all the way back to how a building looked at 1860, or are we going to look at the 50 year prior? Because I mean, something's historic after 50 years. So if they have a, a, mm -hmm. a, I don't know, separated garage or something that was built in the 40s, you know, but are we going to be more concerned with how it looked in the 40s, or do we want to say, well, you know, the 
design element, the intent of this architect, well, that was really fleshed out in 1870. And well, we want you to focus on that. You know, do we really want to lean one way or the other? Do we just want to consider the bigger picture of, well, it has these design elements that were historic in the 18 whatevers, but then in the 1950s, they did this element, which is really unique. So do we want, you know, either or or, or, or water? Because again, it's new construction. So we really, the big picture needs to be, what well, does it fit with the neighborhood? Because the application mm, yeah. we discussed. And I, I think to some extent, we'll have to take it up on a case-by-case -case basis. Absolutely. And partly the applicants absolutely. will make an argument and explain yeah. why it fits. And they might say, look, we are really going close to what it used to be. Or they might emphasize we yeah. really match the house next to us on this side, not so much the one on this side. And here's the reason. And, yeah. well, and, I, think that's, well, and I think that's kind of important, too, because with the cost of building these new new buildings and materials and things, you know, we can't replicate some of this really fine architecture and really, you know, skillfully done things in a cost effective manner. If our goal is, oh, well, we want new construction to to be able to help people that need help getting housing or something. So it's that that balance. Remember the term you just brought up a good point, which was um, the St Secretary of Interior Standards also direct commissions to allow the new work or the alteration work to be differentiated from the existing historic property. Mm -hmm. So what they mean by that is that they don't want you to go in and try to replicate to any high degree an addition especially or anything touching the building or anything on the property because it becomes then confusing to viewers thereafter what was old and what's new. So oftentimes you'll see in commercial buildings, they'll use a glass or a transparent connector between the new structure and the original historic structure. That's right. pretty much considered. So the standard. library would be an example of yeah, this? Yeah, a library is a good example. So nobody's pretending that we're adding on, you know, in the same materials. But I do agree with you. Materials are expensive. So the commission and others are going to be challenged with other synthetic products and other things. <laughs> that homeowners or developers just can't afford to do. Slate's a good example. There's a lot of, I think the commission's seen several alternatives to slate. Um, when slate's done, it's a roof. <laughs> Matt can tell you better than I can. It's a stone roof that's going to last, you know, it could last 100 years. Uh, and even the stone doesn't wear out. The nails do, right? So it's... A, an amazing product. And when you talk about a 30-year payback, which is what a lot of people only care about, they don't want to invest in slate oftentimes. So it's it, that's some of the challenge. The commission's always going to have that challenge of, and I think Liam's right, all you, these standards that we're reviewing by don't say anything about trying to replicate anything from before other than you need to be careful with the scale of it and the location, the setting, and you know what I mean, the relationships and proportions to the rest of the neighborhood. It doesn't discourage people from doing modern work, um, but it has to be done well enough so that it feels like it's compatible. And that's your key word. That's the word that you really want to remember. And, Is it compatible? And I think part of yeah. the structure of having these federal standards with a local commission is that it's our responsibility to think about what those standards are and then apply them to the local circumstances that we know. Yeah. Mm, and that's exactly. yep. that can be pretty challenging. Yes, it can. You know, in yes. a sense, they set standards, but pass the buck about the decision making to us. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Good luck with that. Yeah. But yeah, no. Uh can I ask you questions? Is there a yeah, requirement you, that local standards not uh, can't be more stringent than the federal? They could be. Um, basically, I remember when Bangor's ordinance was prepared, it was actually one of the first in the state. Yeah. <clears throat> may, may have been the first. Um, so it was early in the 80s or late 70s. And the state at that time, State Historic Preservation Office, had a model ordinance that communities could use. So Bangor crafted theirs with some local distinction Um based on the model that was given by the state. Yes, you could. I think the commission has the authority to, through the proper channels, any changes would have to go to the council, you know, I guess, mm -hmm. and be approved as ordinance changes. Right. But there's nothing to say that you can't tinker with that. 
the one thing you don't want to do is go too far away from what the federal requirements are, because oftentimes these projects um, <clears throat> may be actually seeking tax credits. And if they're seeking a tax credit and it's, it's a listed property on the National Register, they have to comply with a lot more than just satisfying the commission's review and getting a certificate of appropriateness. They really have to prove to Augusta and to Washington that the project is historic aspects are being preserved completely. And also the city is a certified local government, which yeah. means that we do adhere to the National Park Service um, right. requirements. Yeah, That's a national, uh, a certified local government means that we have, we're cited as having the, um, <clears throat> the correct composition um, and support. Um, to meet those standards. I think there's 10 CLGs in Maine now, something like that. Um, and it allows us to go after a percentage of the state budget that comes from the federal government to use for purposes to promote historic preservation here. Yeah. Um, and we have done that in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly wasn't suggesting that we would do anything that would in some way countermand the federal guidelines, yeah, right. but right. rather the issue that it appears that there's a lot of interpretation left yeah. the guidelines and whether we would want to interpret them in a somewhat more specific way than has been put out. Yeah. Not yeah. contradictory to, yeah. but mm -hmm. sort of adding to it, if you will. Um, I'd yeah. be wary of getting overly strict on mm -hmm. historic preservation ordinances, especially as not just Bangor, but more communities are addressing, you know, unhoused population issues, um, you know, availability of housing and places to live. We don't want to drop the hammer so hard on historic preservation that we're, yeah. you know, essentially excluding right. all but a select few from being able to, to do anything. Totally mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you have touched on the crux of what we're supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. which is we have standards that we are to determine whether the applicant has adhered to. Yeah. yeah. And we are the judges of that, if you'd like. And if mm -hmm. there, our mm -hmm. decision is not in favor of the applicant, they can take it to the board of appeals and we have those 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 spelled out in our ordinances which help us make those decisions so we can make sure if someone comes up and mike says you need a window mutton that's three quarters of an inch or whatever sure. they come that's they so come and it's, you know well, who would ever say that or whatever we could say oh no 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 see you know per this you know <laughs> we have those guidelines where we can say well look this is the standard and we're going to hold every single applicant to the standard so which is great and I think I think they're very well balanced yeah, towards towards the same. So. I don't know. They're fair, and there's also Peter the the Feds uh, National Park Service puts out a guidelines they call it to commissions, and basically you can go through that booklet and um, or that document, and it'll say, "We recommend this, not this. We recommend this, not that." So if you don't have a copy of that, we should get that maybe to all the commission mm -hmm. members. Yeah, I could just get as a PDF. It's a PDF. I think agenda. we can That'd send it. It's very helpful, um, especially Windows. I think Windows, more than anything else, is confounding to commissions. Um, and every time we get a new application in, it puts the challenge on the commission to, because <clears throat> you're probably going to hear first about how unaffordable it is to maintain wooden windows and all of that. And we go through that whole thing and then, decisions have to be made about and oftentimes synthetic windows are being proposed and that they they can have their place i've seen the commission actually be more critical about the facade front facade of the building and what goes on there for historic product versus the back of the property where it's less seen so um there's all sorts of those fun things to look forward to, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Windows are very important. They define the face of the building. They do. They do. I think, and yes, we've definitely, I think, been as flexible as we could be in some cases. With Absolutely. Windows. I think so. Been very fair, I would say. Try to be. Yeah. So, Anne, is there going to be another RFP put out then for that property? Yeah, is that what's yeah, I've got happen? good direction to prepare something to get that out. Yeah, yeah, and I want to encourage um, the commission to we sometimes send you when we get information on a 
because you're the commission as a whole is a member of the national, I think it's a national alliance of historic yes, right. commissions and That's we send right. webinars and events to you. That's so right. um, to take advantage of those, because I've, I've done a few of those webinars are very yeah, helpful. They are helpful. They used to come and give us training, CLG training every year. Are they not doing that anymore? Yeah, they're going to do it. Um, I forget who's hosting next year, but we're going to be doing it again next year. Yeah. We kind of took a hiatus right. um, in the certified Those are local valuable. government world because of yeah. COVID. And, yeah. But now we're going to do an in-person one. Those are really great. In 2024. So yeah. that'll be good. Because then you'll get to meet the historic commissions from other parts of the state, which is nice. So there'll be one in person for the state. Yeah. So we don't know, probably in Augusta. It might be, although I'm trying to get it in Bangor. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm lobbying on your, yeah, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. What they do very well with that when they will actually do trial reviews. For everybody to hear just the issues we're talking about tonight. Um, an applicant comes in with what may be an inappropriate idea for a new building in a historic district. And you as commissioners have to make decisions about it. And it's really kind of fun because each table, and they mix people up, each table, which is maybe six or eight people, will do their own review and make their comments and everything. Then they'll all play it back at the end and say, you got it right, or... Don't listen to these guys. They don't know <laughs> right. So it, it that was really valuable. That's the National Alliance, right? Yeah. Of historic commissions, right? Yeah. Well, let me know if there's any help I can be for that RFP or if you want to draft. Yeah, I'll probably have you a draft it or before it goes out. Whatever. Yeah. But RFP. Uh, was the city done an RFP for that property? No, I'm not finalizing it. Okay. Now that I've got some direction from you, I can finalize it. Yeah. Well, right. It'll go on to the city's website. And yeah, we'll probably send a notification to the neighborhood just to let everybody know. Yep. So if there's no further discussion of the new construction design guidelines, I'm going to move to the next item on our agenda which is to approve the meeting minutes for October 19th. Anybody want to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll second. Excellent. Uh, and then just by a show of hands, all those in favor, it's unanimous that we've approved the minutes and that takes care of our agenda. So we are adjourned. Thank you all for coming.